with this deification of reason and the vilification or demonization of prejudice, um, we see what exactly Gadamer meant uh, when he said that a prejudice does not necessarily mean a false judgment, right? Uh, but that it can be either negative or positive, right? Place all this positive value on reason, right? And we're slowly peeling away from this, coming back to the realization that, it, or as a society, the realization that um, our reasoning is very, very much biased and shaped, right, uh, by the world we live in. Um, but we have, for the longest time, deified, right, held reason up on this pedestal as something that is clean, like in the museum, right? It's clean, it's untouchable, um, and it serves a purpose, right? That purpose being to guide us in our thinking. Uh, meanwhile, we've kind of tossed prejudice and thrown it in the gutter, as it were. Um, just think of some of the associated terms that we have for these two uh, ideas. Right. For reason, we have uh, being reasonable, uh, reasoning things out, seeing reason. Right. We talk about these when we, uh, 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 with regards to people who we think are not uh, being purely logical. Right. Uh, all and all of them apply some positive uh, notion or a negative notion if they're being directed at someone who isn't exemplifying them. Meanwhile, with prejudice, uh, well, when we say someone is being prejudiced, we mean that these days that they're being unfair um, or generalizing inappropriately. Uh, so prejudice in the term that we use it every day, not in the term in the sense that Gadamer is getting at it. Right. Uh, and therefore, it has acquired... The idea, the concept of prejudice itself, has acquired a distinctly negative understanding, right? A negative value. Though there are many prejudices, in the sense that Gadamer talks about, that are not necessarily negative, right? They simply are value judgments that wind up affecting uh, how, uh, how we act, right? They influence how we act before we have a complete picture, right? Um, think of if you've had a particularly traumatic experience, right? That can give you a negative uh, way of thinking about, say, a particular group of people. Uh, say you're in a hit and run accident and, uh, or you're, yeah, you basically wind up being in a hit and run accident um, and you know that, say, the driver is, like, I don't know, a, a different ethnicity than you, right? And prior to this, you had no real uh, feelings, uh, positive or negative, one way or the other, about people of that ethnicity. But because it was a hit and run, you find out that they didn't have uh, insurance, uh, you know, that they were maybe, like, they got caught doing a crime later on, that same person, um, like, you caught the license plate number and reported it to the police, um, and you were severely injured in this initial accident, it gives you a general sort of, uh, you know, the one traumatic experience can give you a negative valuation of people of that ethnicity, right? And therefore, you wind up going into interactions with them in a negative way, right? Um, and it's only upon repeated interactions with individuals that you wind up revising that initial prejudicial judgment. That can be expressly moral, right? In a negative way. But we can also have other ones that aren't expressly moral. Uh, for example, when I was younger, uh, shortly after Lilo and Stitch came out, I uh, used to do all sorts of voices, right? Uh, and I used to do, like, all the Rugrats, 
kids from the wild, uh, Eliza from the Wild Thornberries, Dexter from Dexter's Laboratory, just all sorts of cartoon voices. And Stitch was one of my favorites at the time. Well, on a flight back from um, New York one time with my mom uh, from seeing relatives, I think we were there to bury a relative actually, but I don't know. She has a big family. It's and they all die off like one or two every uh, a year or so so it's like the most boring version of game of thrones ever um but anyway this was shortly after lilo and stitch came out we were flying back from new york and i wound up you know getting bored it's a four hour flight from new york to dallas um three and a half four hour flight uh so and my mom got bored too so she just said well why don't you do some voices to entertain us and so i started doing voices Right, and I eventually got around to doing Stitch's voice. Well, and I was just cracking my mom up. She couldn't believe I was doing the voice so well. Uh, and finally, the guy who was sat next to us in our aisle uh, perked up and he was like, "Can you do that again?" Can and I was like, "Sure, I can do Stitch's voice. Can you do any other voices?" He not been paying a lick of attention, so I ran through the gamut. Uh, I did Tommy, Chucky, Phil, Lil. Had a whole argument as Phil and Lil from the Rugrats. Um, I did a whole host of other voices too. And it was like, that's really good. Do you think you can do variations of Stitch? Like, can you make Stitch's voice more growly, 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 growly? Right, um, I can't do it anymore. Uh, puberty sucks. Uh, with regards to like voice acting. So, I was like, that's really good. Uh, I'm, and he pulled out a business card and handed it to me and said, I'm the executive, uh, casting director for the Disney channel and, uh, for voice acting. And we're looking at doing a Lilo and Stitch TV show. We're going to be doing auditions in a while, yada, yada. Um, here's my card. Call the number, tell my assistant, uh, my, uh that, uh, I back, uh, you know, Gave you a uh, backdoor inter uh, uh, backdoored you for a one-on-one -on -one interview when we're in where are you um, where are you from Houston when we're in Houston which should be in a couple months three months November ish um, and uh, we'll set up a time once we know more and uh, we'll do a backdoor interview my mom take I was like awesome we'll do um, my mom takes the card puts it in her purse we get home and I'm like mom 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 empty out the car, uh, empty out your purse, let's put the card on the fridge and call him first thing in uh, uh, tomorrow morning, because it was like 9 p.m. by the time we got home uh, that day. So she does, empties out her purse, no card. Refill the purse, empty it out again, item by item this time. Two hairbrushes that weren't there the first time, but no card. Refill it again, empty it out, second wallet that she lost like three years ago, no card. We do this a couple more times. No card. No business card. Any time that we do this. But. A whole bunch of other junk. Right? Um, so, yeah. That was disappointing. Flash forward about six, seven years. I don't know. I'm junior, senior in high school. Hanging out with one of my uh, best friends. And uh, just doing what teenagers do. Walking around the mall. And uh, my best friend, uh, Megan, asked me, Are, is everything okay? And it's like, yeah, why? It's just, you've been a little bit cold and distant lately. Have I done anything? Like, uh, no, 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 you haven't done anything. Is everything all right at home? Yeah, everything's fine at home. I was like, oh, okay. Um, and we continued on and, you know, hanging out. And I couldn't figure out what it was that, you know, why she would bring that up. So I'm thinking, have I been more cold? Have I been more distant lately? And, you know, we make our way to the food court as I'm ruminating on this, just kind of silently stuck in my head as uh, she and my other friends are gabbing about not an uncommon occurrence for me to be lost in my head, um, even at that age. And she winds up, you know, we wind up getting lunch, right? She. And as I'm thinking about this, like really focusing on, on this, like I, I look at her going, why would she bring that up? As she 
pulls her purse around, right? Something that prior to this, she didn't really use pur uh, purses, right? She had a wallet because she was homeschooled. And anytime she left the house, she just needed her keys and her wallet, right? Uh, but this year, uh, she'd moved from being homeschooled to going to public school and started using her pur uh, a purse, right? And I physically felt myself like mentally recoil, right? Just like withdraw uh, at the side of the purse. And I didn't realize, but that one experience with the Disney card uh, wound up being uh, affecting how I viewed people with purses. It went from purses suck, purses are untrustworthy and un uh, 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 you know untrustworthy uh, sources of like storage to people who use purpose uh, purses are a little bit less trustworthy um, than those who don't right so it closed me off mentally from people with purses an odd thing for sure but it's not like I treated people negatively it just influenced how I viewed people right uh, who with purses slightly less trusting right? um, because I don't trust purses, so by association, wound well, not trusting people who use purses. Now, this didn't really have any particularly like seriously negative effects in how I interacted with people. It's not like I was like, oh, those dirty purse users. It just influenced how I understood the world. Right, one traumatic experience, as it were. Um, but this value judgment, purses are untrustworthy, went out and and that stretching out to per, uh, people who use purses are uh, untrustworthy, went out before me as what Gadamer, like what Gadamer calls prejudices, uh, as four structures of understanding. So Gadamer calls them four structures of understanding. Because those are values, like that one, go out before us and shape how we interpret those particular situations. Right. Um, and it interacts how we, or it impacts how we interact with the world, right? How we understand things. So we have those background beliefs and values uh, and of those experiences that shape how we encounter and approach other things. Uh, these beliefs frame the experiences that uh, we encounter uh, beforehand and before we encounter them, right? We've already got like this framework for understanding given to us by our beliefs and it is only upon reflection in most cases that we see whether or not they were an appropriate fit uh, for example you know you can have one really bad experience like with that car accident and live in an area where your interactions with people of you know that ethnicity who wound up you know harming you uh, in, uh, uh, wound up being in that accident with you, uh, further interactions just reconfirm that basic belief, uh, you know, that uh, a belief produced by trauma. Right? Whereas in my case, I realized, whoa, that was a one instance that got way out of hand. That's not an appropriate framework. And I can mold or readjust the framework with effort, right? We can consciously reframe things. But it's like, you know, it's like uh, using glasses, right? They help you see the world, but until you try on like a new prescription or until you realize just how out of focus things actually are when you put your glasses on versus uh, when you take them off, how, how they're still kind of out of focus, you don't update the prescription, right? So until we're faced with pressures, external pressures, new situations that challenge those uh, beliefs that we hold as individuals, right? That show that they might not be the most appropriate fitting beliefs. Uh, then we don't wind up adjusting those preconceived notions, those prejudices that shape our understanding. And even when we do adjust them, oftentimes we don't fully discard them, right? We might keep them around in lesser forms or just newer forms. And that's something that we can't ever really 
escape from because it's just the way we think, right? It's the very nature of thought itself, that it is structured by previous experiences. And it's not just traumatic experiences that shape these beliefs. It can be mundane experiences. Constant exposure, like going back to Hume, right, from months ago at this point, right, um, constant exposure to similar situations uh, to uh, that confirm a belief that we have wind up entrenching the belief further and further until it becomes a general rule of thumb that, yeah, this is the case, or no, don't do this, right? And those become some of our firmest values. Our prejudices. 